friend L. Steve here. Welcome back to Ask Wrestle Juice. You guys left a bunch of great questions leading up to WWE Backlash, and almost none of them are related to Backlash. Nobody really gives a crap about this pay per view, right? I did my video on my Backlash predictions, and like nobody watched it. So uh, that might give you some indication as what people think about it. But regardless, we're going to be watching it on Sunday, this Sunday. Me, Larson, the Enforcer, over at Going In Raw at twitch.tv forward slash Stephen Larson. Come hang out with us. It's a good time. Wrestling, it's always better when you got friends watching with you. Let's dive into these questions because you got a bunch of good ones. Before I hit Dr. Muffin Swagger's question, do me a favor. Hit that thumbs up and the subscribe button. That little notify bell so I always get your new wrestle juice. The good doctor says, do you think tribalism in wrestling is solely the fault of fans or do the companies and wrestlers play a part in it too? So... I think for the most part, it sort of feeds they the both sort of parties feed off each other. But as we know, I mean, going back to the dawn of, I don't know, I guess sports, even actual tribes, tribalism has always been a thing. You pick a side and you defend that side uh, to, vigorously, right? And it's only been amplified in sports, but it predates the internet, social media, diehard fans of sports, of teams, has always been a thing. And I feel like looking back before social media and seeing how the teams would play into it and how the fans would buy into it, I feel like it's mainly on the fans. People really want something to root for, right? And they will go to any lengths to to to, to root for and to defend their team and in the age of social media that's only been amplified because people can find each other and they can fight each other through the safety of the keyboard they don't have to worry about getting stabbed by like a wwe fan if you're sitting there saying that wwe is trash or vice versa now i kind of feel like that wouldn't happen anyways because generally speaking wrestling fans are a bunch of nerds that's more likely to happen at say like a raiders game my point stands, though, social media has kind of amplified the whole tribalism thing. Now, I know Cody is on the record. Cody Rhodes is on the record saying that he feels that some of his uh, promos have contributed to tribalism. And maybe that's true. But I don't know. I kind of feel like there is a personal responsibility aspect to this as well, where fans just need to just bring it down a notch. Just bring it down a notch. It's it's honestly some of the discourse in the Internet wrestling community is just mind-bogglingly stupid. Like, I see some of the tweets out there and the Facebook posts, and some of them are just just completely bereft of any logic or common sense. And I feel like some people just, they need to get, like, a life or something because it's just, it's too much. But I kind of put it on the fans, to be honest. I know that AEW and WWE, they can feed into it sometimes. Uh, but, uh, but no, you know, you, you got to draw the line as a fan. It's entertainment, for God's sakes. You know, these people aren't going to be your best friends. So chill out a little bit. Go find an additional hobby. Like, I don't know, paper mache or what's that origami stuff where you fold paper into cool stuff. But that's a good question. I, I, I think, I don't know, it's solely the fault of fans, but I think it's like a 90-10 split. Some people just need to chill out. Darius the Great says, it may not be May the 4th anymore, but in honor of May the 4th, what wrestler's journey from face to heel is most like Anakin with Skywalker to Darth Vader? I got a great answer for this, by the way. It's Larry Zabisco, because uh, he, uh, his whole journey being the protege of Bruno San Martino, starting when Larry apparently just sort of stumbled into Bruno's backyard, and Bruno was like, you look like a wrestler, and he was like, yeah, I'm a wrestler. And so he became wrestler. And then he had this terrific journey being a, a, a face who couldn't shake being the protege of Bruno San Martino, the greatest wrestler that ever lived. And then eventually him and Bruno have a match because he's trying to shake his mentor's uh, shadow. And, and, and Bruno sends him out of the ring and, and, and Larry gets frustrated and he takes a chair and he breaks Bruno's neck with it. Or something. I, I don't know exactly what happened. And uh, and then Larry even ended up feuding with Bruno's son, David, a little bit after that. So, uh, yeah, I kind of feel like there's some parallels there. I don't know who Bruno is in this situation. Probably Obi-Wan, right? That would make the most sense. Uh, so, anyways. And then he later on, after Bruno retired, Larry was going around saying that he retired him. Uh, so, yeah, it made for a great story. 
from what I understand. I haven't watched a lick of any of that stuff. I just remembered the story and I looked it up and I was like, oh yeah, that's kind of, that's a pretty good answer right there. Good job, me, and good good question, Darius. Thank you for that. Melaquai Perez asks, in honor of Doctor Strange coming out Thursday, what wrestlers would you like to see crossover promotions in a multiverse of madness style event? Can be any wrestlers popping in on any promotion. I'll be honest with you, anything that WWE does, I think an AEW, uh, I'm sorry, a WWE AEW show, that's kind of what we all want to see, right? How awesome would that be? All the awesome. That'd be fantastic. I'd love to see it. You get to see Vince and Tony Khan and then maybe Nick Khan up there in like an owner suite, mixing it up, having some popcorn, watching their dudes battle. That'd be awesome. I want to see that shit. Uh, let's see here. John Davies says, hey, Steve, post-mania, there has been a large discrepancy between the quality of Raw and SmackDown. Conversely, prior to Mania, SmackDown was the much better show. Why are WWE seemingly incapable of producing two good shows at the same time? I don't know. I, I mean, I kind of do know because one guy runs the entire thing, and that's Vince McMahon. And when both shows, it, it seems obvious that he's capable of running one good show. And uh, for whatever reason, his attention seems to drift between the two shows in phases that usually last several months. Right now, Raw is actually a pretty fun show to watch if you can truncate some of it, commercials and recaps using your DVR or perhaps some sort of streaming service. Uh, SmackDown, on the other hand, although this past week was actually pretty decent. I don't think it was that bad. They had that cool cage match. Um, SmackDown, by and large, generally has been kind of a boring show lately. They don't really... There's a lot of spinning of wheels there on uh, on SmackDown. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I think Vince sort of treats his properties as shiny new toys. He gets one going. He's like, yeah, okay, I want to focus over here on this one. Yeah, I want to focus over here on this one. It's just how Vince operates. Uh, Stephen James says, with AEW and New Japan expanding their working relationship, uh, can you envision a scenario where an AEW wrestler wins the G1 in the coming years? I can think of one as uh, Brian Danielson. I think that's a possibility. I think that New Japan would be totally cool with that, especially if he went on a bit of a run there in New Japan. Uh, there's the possibility they would allow him to pick up the world title too. I'm not sure how likely it is, but I think it's a possibility. Uh, Vanessa Boy asks, do you think there is a place in AEW for a giant character? I believe she's referring to Satin Singh here. She says, I'm up for giving him a chance and having a diverse roster, but it really feels out of place. It does feel out of place because generally speaking, AEW is a place where wrestlers wrestle. Satnam Singh is not that. I'm not sure what he can do in the ring. Maybe he'll be impressive. Maybe not. I really don't know. Um, I'm willing to give him a shot. Uh, yeah, we'll see how all that works out. But I think it's kind of cool. It's it's something different for AEW. It's a bit more of a WWE type thing that they're doing with Satnam Singh. We'll see where it goes. Hopefully there's place for there's a place for him there. But uh, I don't know. I'll sort of believe it when I see it, you know. Tyler Warden asks, which activity would you rather do? Eat tacos with Thunder Rosa, go toy hunting with Ethan Page, or stream games with Chugs? No offense to Thunder Rosa or Ethan Page. I do love tacos and I do love toys. But streaming games with Chugs would be absolutely amazing. He seems like the most delightful person. I've been lucky enough to have a conversation in person with him when I visited the WWE Performance Center a couple years ago, and he is an absolute delightful person. Seems like the nicest guy. I think he's terrific. So I think it'd be streaming games with good old chugs. Next up for Spider Bite. What do you think about Hangman turning semi-heel? Spider Bite here says, I love the idea. I hope he fully turns. I like it for the CM Punk thing. I actually really like it because they're telling a very subtle story with Hangman Page. He's not taking anybody's shit. He got launched in this title scene after a very emotional feud that lasted years with uh, Kenny Omega. Well, the whole story lasted years. The feud, the feud was a little bit less than that. Um, and, uh, and now he's like, man, I'm champion. What am I going to do? And all these people are gunning for him. And he's like, now I'm not a pushover. Yeah, I might have gotten this title by beating that one guy, but I'm no pushover. And, uh, and you know, CM Punk comes in, everybody's chanting CM Punk, and Hangman's like, you know what? Fuck that. Fuck that guy. I think it's cool. So I hope that mainly it's not like, oh, a heel turn. I hope it's more like, hey, this guy's just not going to be anybody do anybody's doormat because too many faces are doormats. That's kind of how WWE books their faces. Uh, let's see here. This is kind of a long question. 
Uh, C T Van says, uh, so we all agree. Impact Impact Wrestling has done a terrific job of staying the course and bringing out consistently strong television. They've got some good talent, care about storylines, and have always held their women's division in high regard. Those are all true things. What would you advise they do to help elevate them to start competing with AEW for the number two ranked North American wrestling company? He says, move to bigger venues, bring in some known legends, get onto a streaming platform, or even bring back the six-sided ring. No, none of those things are going to do it. The thing is, AEW is loaded with money. They've got cable television and... uh, Like real cable television, like Warner, you know, Turner and TNT and all that stuff. Impact has none of those things. They seemingly do have money to spend on talent, but they do bulk tapings. They're not live. Their production quality is not quite that what AEW is. AEW is built on a bet that they could sell out a 10,000 strong arena at all in. Uh, Tony Khan saw that, realized this talent can draw. And if you add a lot of money to that, meaning you can sign guys like CM Punk, Brian Danielson, Mox, Jericho, et cetera, et cetera, then you'll get that TV deal. You'll sell out arenas, et cetera, et cetera. Impact can't do that because they don't have the kind of money to compete. So they can't be the number two company. You need real draws to do that. And unfortunately, in Impact, if you build up these draws, they will go draw somewhere else. Because Impact has money, they don't have WWE or AEW money. So, there's nothing they can do to to compete with AEW. All they can do, really, is try to focus on themselves, focus on their business, and try to make money best they can, and just stay afloat, maybe turn a profit. Uh, And they do a great job of what they do, but they're not going to be on the level of AEW simply because they don't have billionaire money. AEW does. Moving on. Al Kasai says, do you think there's such a thing as the perfect wrestler? Yes, it's Asuka. Nick Weed says, "Do you? Th- what do you think has been the most perfectly built AEW feud? He says, I think everything they've done with Wardlow has been flawless. It has been flawless. The Wardlow build has been great. I felt that the Kenny Omega Hangman Page story, granted it took a couple years and uh, it took a couple of uh, twists and turns that maybe felt a little out of place. I thought it was a really done, a well done feud, though. But yeah, the Wardlow one so far has been absolutely perfect. Let's hope they nail. Let, let's hope they stick the landing, so to speak, because timing and wrestling is kind of everything. Dynasty's Edge asks, "What more risky gimmick repackagings positively surprised you the most?" Meaning. It was I wasn't expecting it to work, but ended up loving it. Dynasty's Edge says it's my love of Ezekiel, which inspired this question. Ezekiel is a great answer, by the way. The repackaging of of him. Number one, he's a very, uh, I don't know, wink and a nudge type character, type performer, I should say. There's a self-awareness to the performer that really translated. It always translated really well for Elias, but the gimmick was just too low of a ceiling for him to do anything with it long term. Ezekiel doesn't really suffer from that. And right now in the short term, it's a terrific repackaging. Anybody else that's been repackaged in a way that I was really into? Uh, uh, Scott Steiner into Big Papa Pump. I thought that was a, 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 a turn with his character where he was basically bereft of having a character prior to that when he was just Steiner brother. And then he went and became the Big Bad Booty Daddy. And I remember thinking at first, like, what? So he's got a a blonde hair and he's got a blonde goatee and he's wearing and he's calling himself White Thunder, which he did at that first Nitro because I was there. Uh, And then uh, and then he became the big bad dude. He was just horny guy at that point. I thought that was pretty great. I mean, that that's what he built the rest of his career on. Uh, Adam Masters asks, does knowing that Roman Reigns will probably beat the Rock at WrestleMania take away anything from the excitement of the match? Are there any circumstances where the Rock should win? No, no, and no, not at all. No, Roman should win that match. And no, in that case, it's the journey, which is interesting. Your boy Jordan asks, which wrestler or wrestlers on the men and female rosters on NXT 2.0 do you feel like has the most star potential on the main roster slash possibly other promotions? Well, Braun Breaker is an easy guess. I would say Carmelo Hayes could be a big star 
Uh, I think um, Grayson Waller has everything it takes. I still am not into his character at all, but I feel like everything I've seen from him in the ring and his natural charisma, he can probably turn me at some point if they tweak his character a little bit. He doesn't really do much for me now, but I could totally see it. Another name is Nikita Lyons. I think if she gets her promo down, she will be over massively. Uh, Sonny says, what is your favorite era of Bullet Club? It's going to be it's going to be pre AW Kenny Bullet Club. It's when I got into it. His character his cleaner stuff. The Young Bucks being there. Gals and Anderson. All those guys, that's going to be... Well, Gallows and Anderson had kind of left at that point. But, yeah, it's going to be that era of Bullet Club. Um, I didn't really watch a whole lot of AJ's Bullet Club. And I actually really loved uh, uh, Finn Balor's Bullet Club as well. But that was mainly just because I really loved... Why well, I, li- I like going back and watching the Prince Devitt stuff. But, like, I got in, I understood, I knew about Bullet Club when Kenny was the leader. And that's, that's, that's going to be my prime Bullet Club. It's kind of a mess now. Uh, Let's see here. Uh, The champ asks, how long do you see good old JR lasting on commentary? I'll be honest with you. If he makes it past the end of this year, I'll be kind of surprised. He's kind of a mess. Masked Man says, greatest moment asks, what's the greatest moment in wrestling that nobody talks about? I'll be honest with you. I think I know this answer for me personally. So, Rock Hogan was like a big deal, right? That was like a massive WrestleMania match. Some call it the biggest match of all time because it's the biggest movie star slash star of his generation, The Rock, and you got Hulk Hogan. I mean, it's it's it was a true passing of the torch moment. It was amazing. But what preceded that when Hogan, and I just to research this, I just watched this again. When Hogan showed up in the NWO, I don't think Vince really realized just how immediately the fans did not give a shit about the NWO and how much they loved to have Hogan back. Hogan came to the ring on a raw, the raw following uh, no way out 2002 and he gets to the ring and he gets in there and instead of like booing him because he's part of the NWO, the crowd went nuts for Hulk Hogan they made the connection that he's back after 10 years, nine years, whatever. Hulk Hogan's back in the WWF. We don't care about what he did in WCW. We don't care about the NWO. And that moment when he's in there and he gets overwhelmed with emotion because they are showing him so much love and commentary tries to pass it off as, oh, a lot of mixed reactions here. No, they were firmly on board with Hulk Hogan. Rock comes out and they try to run this angle where Hogan's a bad guy and everything. But you saw what happened at WrestleMania. The crowd was so split. Uh, that doesn't really get talked about enough. Sort of the lead up to that, I thought was absolutely something that just they did not realize what they had on their hands. They could not, they couldn't predict that as happen uh, as, as having happened. And uh, it was a real special moment. I remember watching that. And I got chills. I was like, oh, this crowd doesn't care about the NWO. They care about Hogan. And that's how it all played out. Anyways, that's going to do it. I had Bug up there on the couch. Now she is. Oh. She's right there. What? What is she doing on the floor? What are you doing on the floor? Hey. What's this? What's this? Jeff. Ignores me. Anyways. Hey, do me a favor. Go watch my backlash predictions. Nobody's watched that video. It's doing like worse business than the than the Steve Thunder stuff which is terrific too. You should go check out that video also. Anyways, I'll see you with one of those videos. Hopefully it's the Backlash Predictions one, man. Let me know what you guys thought about all this in the comments below. We'll see you over one of those videos.